Hi, I'm Kevin Reynolds, director, and uh, I'm fortunate enough to be here today to talk with Ridley Scott um, about his little gem of a picture, The Duelist, which I first saw in 1978 when I was a kid, uh, just starting to make films myself. And little did I realize that uh, some 24 years later I'd be here talking with Ridley about a film that profoundly affected me and uh, had an enormous influence on me as a young filmmaker. Um, the Duelist is a film that I would say probably 98% of the movie going public has never had the opportunity to see, but um, it is, it's magnificent. And um, to be able to sit here with a master filmmaker like Ridley and discuss what went into the picture and what um, some of his motivations were uh, and talk about it from a technical standpoint as a filmmaker is just a real pleasure for me. And I hope those of you that are interested in such things uh, will enjoy it as well. So without further ado. Here's Ridley Scott. So really, can you just, can you tell me what the genesis of the project was? This was the fourth attempt to do a feature film. And um, uh, I finally met with Jerry Vaughan Hughes. And uh, in fact, Jerry had written one more thing prior to this film called The Gunpowder Plot. And uh, I tried with that and failed. The Guy Fawkes story? Yeah. Huh. yeah. And even though that's still sitting on the shelf, it's pretty good, right? Uh. And, uh, but I thought the turn down meant that was final, so I said, let's go again. And at that moment, I was looking for public domain material because I couldn't afford to pay. I was paying the screenwriter, so I couldn't afford to buy a story. So I was combing um, through you know, various 19th century writers. And Conrad had this short story, which I learned later was a sketch for a much larger book about the Napoleonic era. And that's how The Duelist came about. I sent it to Jerry. Jerry said, I love it. And the upshot was he actually wrote the script. It was necessary, I think, to establish Dubert as the hero of the picture, to involve the audience with him um, intimately, and to show him with a private life of any kind. In the early part of the story, he is simply soldier and duelist. In Conrad's version, he doesn't have a, a private life, particularly. So. Um, Sounds a bit ungallant, but uh, Laura is produced to give him a private life. <laughs> Once this is done, I wanted to use their relationship, which is a happy one initially, to show how the pressure, the anxiety of the dueling takes Dubert over and makes it impossible for him to care for her, really much to notice her. This life-centered relationship is destroyed by the whole death-centered um, business of the dueling. What was your budget on this? Uh, all in $900,000. $900,000. Yeah. Which, even at the time, was, you know, listen, it's a first movie. Yeah. And we forget, you know, you and I forget. Or, or maybe we don't now, actually. We were grateful for any studio who says, uh, OK, you got the money. So I was eternally grateful that they gave me $900,000 to make me go and do, make the movie. Well, it's definitely all up on the screen. I'm assuming in this scene here, this first sword fight, that beautiful structure in the background that's up on blocks almost, yeah. that's, that's an existing structure you probably oh, yeah. guys didn't build. Yet. There's nothing built in this film because I couldn't afford it. But um, in fact, this is interesting. This is the first day of principal photography. And the guy he's fighting, I think, is Alec Guinness's son. Wow. And uh, Harvey said, I don't want buttons on these swords. You can see them. I said, OK, it's pretty dangerous. And Harvey had only learned to handle a sword for the last two weeks. so. The special effects guy came up with a great idea saying, I've got, the, I've got it, two car aerials. So these are car aerials. Really? Yeah. And Brilliant. what you forget is that when he lunges, they've already slightly bent the aerial. Uh -huh. So he actually went la, and now he ran uh, the, his opponent through. <laughs> <laughs>
That's great. And Bill Hobbs was your fight yeah, yeah. arranger. Yeah. Did you use Bill Hobbs? I used Bill Hobbs on the Count of Monte Cristo. Yeah, but yeah. He's great. Well, you know, the great thing about the sword organizer, the ranger, it's, it is kind of choreography, right? Yes. And uh, what is great about Bill is he actually understands the, that it's part of the drama. Yes. It, right? It's two characters in a dialogue scene with steel. Right. Well, the thing people don't realize in a fight yeah. is the difficult thing is that you have to choreograph it so that the two mm -hmm. actors know where the next move is coming from so they don't kill each mm -hmm. other. But at the same time, you have to make it look like you don't know that next move is coming. Exactly. Yeah. Oh. In this scene, you get your first taste of this beautiful interior lighting, which to me is just the hallmark of this picture. Because when I first saw this film, I was, I was very young. I saw it in Austin, Texas, and I was so taken by just the beauty of these interiors, how, how you let um, the dark side just fall off more. In most pictures I'd seen up to that point, they were yeah. all filled in, but yeah. they just let it fall off, and it was so beautifully natural. Yeah. Well, Frank, it, Frank Tidy. Frank Tidy. Mm -hmm. Was that Russia. Frank, or was that you? Uh, no, a bit of each. Frank, Frank and I had done probably at least, of all the commercials I'd done, probably done at least 200 commercials together. So, you know, at that moment, we were virtually phoning it in. There was no concern about me con how much is in the shadow. And Frank knew I, this is what I liked. Mm -hmm. And I don't mind if windows blow out. I don't mind if it burns out. I don't mind sometimes if it goes totally dark. And Frank just knew really how far to go. But that was great. And uh, but it's the only film I ever did with Frank, actually. You did fight a duel this morning. Of course. You make dueling sound like a pastime in the Garden of Eden. Now, how did you come to select um, Carradine and Keitel for these two roles? In fact, I'd cast two guys. I'd cast Oliver Reed and I'd cast uh, Michael York, both great swordsmen. At that particular moment, I wanted the money, and the studio said, uh, we don't want to go down that route. If you want the money, they gave me a list of four guys. And, the, and the, two of the guys on the list made sense was Keitel and Carradine. So I went after these two. I flew to Hollywood under my steam, came here for two weeks. I was here two and a half months out to go and buy clothes because the opening shot with Keitel says, you've got to be out of your mind. How do you expect me to play Hazar? Mm -hmm. Took two and a half months of persuasion. I used to see him four times a week. Eventually, I got at him by talking about food France and cigars, he'd never been there. And that's swung him. I think that finally did the trick. Well, it was, it's great. I mean, his personality, he's such an intense guy. Yeah. He's so perfect for this role. Yeah. yeah, Keith eases into this in an easier fashion. Um, and uh, I think Keith had also done a little bit of theater. I had lunch with him once, and I actually asked him about how, how he got, came to this, and he said, he, you convinced him that the food would be fabulous and it would be like a big vacation. That was finally the, that was finally the deal. Mm. Hold him, Gabriel. Are you holding on to the table? No! Rashad, is he on the table? No, 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 no! Oh, got you! Got you. You see, I couldn't afford to go outside this tent because all I've got is what you see in the background. So I did it inside the tent. Mm -hmm. That's all the extras you had. That's it. But that's what's so great. I mean, when you do it well like this, I mean, you, you create the illusion that there's so much more outside the frame. When yeah. you've got everything you've yeah. got right there. Yeah. And you know, you could have started saying outside, I gotta see the camp, I gotta see the people, I gotta see the kitchens. Then I come inside, and you know what? All that would end up in the editing that's room. Right. It's finally knowing what that is, isn't it? It is. Yeah. In a picture that I think is just full of stunning, ravishing images, I think this shot is probably my favorite. Yeah. This is just magnificent. What time of day was this done? This is about, uh, you're losing the light here around 4 o'clock, so this is about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and I've got to do the master. What happened here on the first take, Harvey couldn't control the horse, galloped straight through the shot, and uh, leapt from the horse, cursing and swearing and shouting at everybody in general, and meanwhile, the light was dropping, and I had to get him out again, so this was a successful. That's why we stop him short, so there's somebody there catching the horse, because Harvey couldn't stop the right horse. Right behind the camera. Exactly. And uh, then I thought it was so beautiful, I thought, why not let this play? 
So the fact that I was losing the light dictated how I'd handle the whole scene, which is really, this keyed in to the idea of why don't I use the idea of paintings as oh, it's chapters. Fabulous. Is yeah. there a grad in the top of this? Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. I was gradding. And, uh, no silks though, I use Tiffin filters, yeah. right? Which are very little diffusion. They just do something to the black. Yeah. yeah. And I noticed that throughout a lot of the picture, you've got grads yes. at the top of it. And again, it helps to just really create this atmosphere, this, this yeah. wonderful coldness to the whole picture. Yeah. But you know, winter months are beautiful. Mm. I'd lost, the, I'd wreckied when it was fully green, which was absolutely ravishing. And as I got there, because it took so long to get the money, all the leaves had gone. So I'd mm. arrive in the kitchen and say, what happened? But you know, I gradually realized it was an advantage because it was so beautiful. Um, and because it was the opposite of what I'd wanted, which was lush beauty, it somehow makes it more austere. Mm. And therefore, it, I don't know, it just works better. When you did, did scenes like this, or what's your style really? Is it different than it was in as far as how you'd rehearse the actors? Did you come in and know where you wanted to put them before the scene, or did you let them rehearse and sort of place themselves, and you, you sat back and figured out the coverage you wanted, or what? No, I always know. <laughs> I know, and I've been through every which way with them. And when I've sat there and said, well, let's walk through the scene, you know? And, but actually, I know exactly where I want them to be, and so gradually I edge them into the position of where it needs to be, mm -hmm. more or less. Now, Harvey, I think you were a little... Could you... I'm on a fairly long lens. Could you pull a, come a little closer to him? <laughs> Follow him in a little closer. <coughs> Where's it? There. OK, OK, Keith, could you just hit the mat, please? Huh? OK, just... Boom. Crunch. OK, there's a rush, general rush that won't be there yet, so there'll be a beat later, OK? Then they start coming in, then Harvey walks forward, I think. No, just hold oh. Harvey. And I think most actors are very happy about... If providing they feel confident right. with you, there's no questions. That you, it all just falls into place and it just starts to move. Right. And I think, again, it's all about making decisions. You know? It is. I mean, different directors have such different styles because some directors like to just sit back and let the actors do what they want, and then they just put a camera up and record it. Yeah. But yeah. visualists like you, you like to force the eye, which yeah. you have to do. You have to do. You just have to. Well, you do that as well. And, it, and so, you know, you, you... And finally, it's for them. It serves them and the story. Mm. Now, sometimes if I've ever had a hard push on that with somebody, which rarely happens, I've basically said, you know, this proscenium is all about you, and it's all about making you look appropriate and or good. So if we fiddle a bit, it's for a good purpose. Mm -hmm. And usually they relax. Hold it there. Good. Okay. <laughs> yep. And turn over. Ronnie. Mark. 106, take one. Okay. You know, what I like about the script always when I keep revisiting it is the elegance of the choice of the writer that is very minimalistic, very specific, and always loaded with humor if you're looking for it. Mm. So that, that's Jerry. And it's all there. It's all there on the page. I like to be very particular, and I think it helps. After all, the script is the first thing that happens in a movie. Someone has to sit down and... Um, produce what everybody else starts from. And I think um, I like for myself, and I think it's helpful for other people, to be very specific, to describe exactly what you yourself see. But um, it can't possibly be the director's duty to go and find, well, I can think of the, uh, the third duel, the duel with sabers, which is fought in a partly lowered barn. I imagine that being fought under a stand of big elms with the rooks whirling and cackling in the trees. Um, well, that was okay. It was quite a nice thought. And the way Ridley did it was superb. And, and certainly it's not his job to go and find a stand of elms to shoot under because that happens to be what you've written. This exhaustion that these guys manifest in the scene, which makes it work so great, yeah. did, they, did they have to create that, or was that real? 
it was real because I did one long take. I did two masters notes, so they're absolutely bugger. Huh. And then turned around and said, right, quick, <laughs> you keep going. And the key was to start in the middle of it, not start with the beginning. Yeah. The, 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 I decided that you, this is in progress. So in other words, you can already start with the blood and the sweat. I didn't uh, push them, they decided and said, no, we're going to do it with the real blades, which of course are blunted. But that epi, or whatever it is, the point, um, even, you know, you can't use the button because you can see it, okay? Yeah. And so the point ground off would go through you quite easily and you wouldn't even know it had happened. Literally, when, it, when you pulled it out, you'd probably then go, oh, it's like a razor blade cut. It hurts about five minutes later. And they're very dangerous pieces of steel. And the, the sabers were full weight sabers, which even with a blunted edge, you know, would still give you a nasty wound. But they went through the whole process of uh, four, four sword jewels with them because it does really does it affects your performance. And as soon as you put a fiber blade on, as opposed to you know a, a two second swing, but the fiber blade takes a quarter of a second. You know what I mean? Be and this, it affects the weight, the manner, everything. Uh, and the attitude. And the attitude. Had they rehearsed this fight? Yeah, Bill Hahn? they rehearsed this outside in the field somewhere. They had two weeks rehearsal on swords, uh, which is pretty good considering what they did. I mean, Keith had handled sword before, and Harvey had never handled a sword in his life. So Harvey did a really good job. Keith was like wary because he said, Jesus Christ, tell them to keep to his marks, right? <laughs> and, uh, so <laughs> Harvey didn't strike me as a guy who's he good said, at keeping to yeah, his marks. You know, screw the marks, wimp, yeah. right? <laughs> <laughs> We're coming up on uh, maybe maybe the most well-known fight in the film. Right. Why don't we talk about that a bit? Yeah. Oh, the uh, the cavalry charge. Yeah. In that sequence, the charging each other through the force. I mean, the setting is so wonderful, and the mist and all. Was the mist there? Did you accentuate that? Oh, you put it. You put oh, it all yeah. in. Yeah. I was a smoke demon. Although at that time in the morning, with the, we got a, the wrong map, and of course it was the, fate, the crucial day I got to get out of there. And I ended up on the south bank of the, of the Dordogne, and it was total blocked out white mist. It was beautiful. And I suddenly heard a car horn, and we started shouting at each other in the fog, saying, where are you? And he said, well, I can't tell where I am because I can't see. And so I lost about an hour that way before I realized the unit was on that side of the river and I was on this side. Mm. So then I had to do a two-mile deviation to find them. And, and you still had to shoot the entire scene in that one day. I had to. Oh, yeah. when, in that sequence, when, when Carradine is, is sitting there before the charge, and you, and you just do this wonderful push-in on him in profile, and he's starting to shake, mm -hmm. and you intercut very quickly mm -hmm. with, with subsequent action and yeah. all. Flashbacks. Was that, was that the, the flashbacks, was that, was that a design on your part, or was that something you discovered in post? Editing. In editing. Because I, I cut it straight and then looked at it and thought, I don't think it's enough because it's critical that we believe that Carradine may believe he may die. Uh -huh. And therefore, all I had was to have his light flashing before him. <laughs> so we just tried the, the little inserts. And at the time, I had a bit of an argument with various people saying, but this is not really the style of the movie. We're suddenly disturbing the audience at that moment away from what seems to be the sound saying, well, that's the whole point. Mm. So I, I decided that that's what I wanted, and I left it at that. I think it works. Oh, it's fantastic. It just builds such tension from what it would otherwise be a very static shot, as you said, where you're just exactly. pushing in on him as he begins yeah. to shave. And actually, the first experience was um, I put it together, and of course, as an inexperienced filmmaker, I wanted everything in it, and it was far too long and drawn out. And that, that moment was pre-score. So we looked at it without any temp, which is, I think, always dangerous. Some editors say, no, no, you should look at it dry, okay? I don't, I don't agree. I think you've got to look at it with whatever you need and to make it work, you mm -hmm. know? Because otherwise you can discard a lot of material if you're looking at it dry that you may have been able to use. Um, and uh, so I, I nibbled a bit. Actually, I was fairly courageous, nibbled a bit, didn't panic, said, let's get the music on. Because a couple of people were saying, my God, my God, what are you going to do? It's so slow. And I said, Get the music on, icy calm, right? And we got a temp score, and it suddenly started to get, take on its own momentum. Mm -hmm. It's so easy suddenly to have an accident. We had an accident on the last day of shooting, didn't we? 
What was that? Uh, Keith was thrown by his horse. We were do doing some pickups on the cavalry job, and the horse just, for whatever reason, decided to throw him literally into a tree. But he ended up in the hospital on the, on the last day, last day in France. And you suddenly realize how quick, boom, yeah. like that, end of, end of movie, you know? And we'd gone through nine weeks with them, with Blaze, whistling past each other like that, uh, with hardly a bruise. And suddenly on the last day, he's wiped out against a tree. I mean, you know. Did you board this sequence out? Totally. Com yeah. Completely. Every shot, blow by blow. So you knew every piece that you needed? Yeah, because, you know, people say, well, it doesn't leave room for error. I said, on the contrary, it leaves me, it means I've thought it through. And it means I don't need anything else. Right. But they said, do you leave room for other things to happen? I say, of course. But at least you've got a plan. We've got a plan. And usually, if we're well designed, I don't really need anything fortuitous to happen. Unless it happens magically when he's asking um, his lady to marry him, and the two white horses behind are not behaving, and one is trying to mount the other, and that was really good, so I just kept running. That's, for, that's nice when that kind of thing happens. Speaking of that scene, when, when he's, he's proposing to her, and the two horses and, and the horses start to act up. Did that throw the actors? When they did, that? did it change the dialogue no. at all? No, she they started stayed giggling. on book. She starts. She giggling. starts giggling. And that's not designed because he's meant to be proposing, so she's giggling. So that worked because she thinks he's uncomfortable, but she's giggling because she can see the horse has got a giant erection. <laughs> Sorry, but that's what it was. You can cut that out if you like. Before I forget, can you talk for a bit about Tom Ran and the costume? I mean, how you guys came to yeah. this Yeah, Tom had done a lot of commercials for me, so I knew him well. And, uh, and so this was to me my first, so Tom was a natural choice. And uh, we pretty well made all the female costumes in the UK and, and the normal costumes. But the, the, the great military costume were made in Italy at Peruzzi. And what I learned at that time was a big lesson in filmmaking. I paid for the costumes. They owned them. I thought, wait a minute, that's not, that doesn't work, mate. That really, I was furious about that, because just the costumes for these two guys at the time cost me 19,000 pounds. And so I said, how is it if I bought them, they own them? And they said, that's the deal. Were you guys slavishly authentic? Yes. Yeah, it shows. Yeah. I want to talk about the final duel, okay. that wonderful setting, the final duel, that okay. castle. Now, where was that? That was, again, in the outskirts of Sala. And I'd gone down a country road one day looking because I thought it would be in a forest. Mm. And um, you know how you keep going down the road and down the road and the road doesn't end? And then the road ended and right at the end of it was the ruin. So you had gone ahead of time and seen how the light was hitting and you knew when you wanted to set up for these? I used to go and sit there. I'd sit there and cigar and just sit and watch. I, I figured the opportunity would occur between, you know, two and five. Uh -huh. So I'd pace the ground, keep going round and round, and then say, okay, that there, that there, that there, and then I'd hit the storyboard and I'd put a clock on it. So this sequence was boarded as well? Totally. Based on this location? Yeah. Yeah. But I used to location hunt manically, yeah. endlessly. Well, it pays off. I mean, to me, in the great films, the great films. The place is another character. Yes, exactly. And it's certainly the case, I think, in this film, for shot sure. John Ford knew, didn't he? John Ford yeah. really pr probably shot the desert better than anyone. Yeah. And then at the end, after the final duel, when you get that great voiceover from Carradine, and then mm -hmm. Keitel is left alone to digest mm -hmm. it all, mm -hmm. and that wonderful final image of the picture where he's standing up on the bluff looking out in the, in the Sun is breaking through the clouds so magnificently. Tell, tell us about that. Actually, I'd seen this image in all the research material in black and white of Napoleon looking across France. He was standing on the top of a rise, and he was looking across a high rise. He was looking across hills and valleys and fields. And the image of Napoleon seemed to be perfectly appropriate for the Keitel character. And um, it was a bad day. It had been raining. And we'd had to organize the dolly on a push-up, about 30-degree push-up, because I couldn't get up. And I wanted a track in. 
I didn't want to build a flat platform, do a straight one. I wanted to, I couldn't get a crane up there. So David Cadwallader, who's the grip, says, I can push it there, because he's like that. So he arranged the thing on a shallow grade on the, with a movie all the dolly is heavy. They carry the dolly up the hill. They put it on there. And um, somebody on the top said, you know what? I think the sun's going to come out. So I said, get Harvey, get Harvey. You know, stand him on the edge. And then it discovered Harvey gets vertigo. So Harvey said, I'm not standing on the edge. <laughs> so this argument, and I can see that the sun is going to happen. So I said, I'll move him back three feet. Three, 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 feet from the edge, so we did, and Harvey's like, Ugh, on the edge, because he's about 700 feet uh -huh. up. And uh, we action, track up, and this is the great thing about operating as well, because you can adjust and move and adjust all the time and whisper, crane up a little bit slower, faster, you know? You're in it, you're in the shot. And uh, as I arrived, the sun came out, just glimmered, and then went, and then glimmered again, and then it kept coming, I I'd see it's gonna keep coming. It was so great, I, want, I figured that we have the shot, so then you talk Harvey through it, say, Harvey, I wanna ask you to do something a second, don't move. Just slowly turn to face east. He said, which way is east? I said, to your right, okay? So he starts turning to his right, and as that, we then track back down. As we track back down, the sun comes out again, more, brighter. And then, and so there was the last shot. Well, talk about serendipity. Yeah. I mean, every picture is completely different. Sure. And mm -hmm. somehow, some of them are just blessed, and they have a serendipity yeah. to it. And I would yeah. imagine this one certainly must have had. Oh, this did. And uh, the only shock, I mean, was, there was no shocks with the film, because by the time I'd finished the movie, we'd got this very nice thing of being the, the official British entry at Cannes. I got, the upshot was I got, I didn't get the Palm d'Or, I got the Grand Jury Prize, and Padro Padroni got the Palm d'Or. Shall I do the clap? Yeah. Well, congratulations. How do you feel about it? Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> and I thought, oh, this is great. And I went to, we brought it to America. They released it and they made seven prints. So I ended up in one theater in LA, Fine Arts down here, which is actually a good little theater still. And Austin, Texas, I think, which is where you right. saw it. Uh, New York, Chicago, seven, seven theaters. And I never complained. I thought, oh, that's good. But the thing that it really did here, which was puzzling, because they both didn't understand how to sell it but it opened the gate for me in a big way. Well, it was a, it was a very influential film for me because when I saw it, I was just starting to make little pictures. Mm -hmm. And I was so taken by it because it was so unlike anything I'd ever seen before. And it's always stuck with me. I mean, it's just a beautiful piece of work. It's a little, it's a little gem that I'd say probably 98% of the public doesn't even know exists because they've mm -hmm. never had an opportunity to see it. Hopefully they will now. Hopefully DVD. they will now. Yeah. Magnificent film. Since most of you will probably never have an opportunity to see this wonderful picture on film, the next best thing will be to see this new DVD version of it. Uh, and I hope that all of you get an opportunity to, because uh, you, you just can't, you can't appreciate what a great piece of work that this is. It had uh, such an enormous effect on me. Uh, it influenced my last picture, The Count of Monte Cristo. Uh, and I looked at it over and over again in preparation for my own film. And uh, I continue to do so because it's such a rare piece of work. I think it's one of Ridley's best films. Um, and there was a real serendipity to this picture, as you may have heard us talk about, that some films are blessed and some aren't. And I think this one certainly was. The gods wanted The Duelist to be what it is. And uh, I hope you guys like it as much as I do. <laughs>